helping whatever way I can. We're uh, on vacation, and um, I am refreshed by uh, renewing acquaintances and uh, coming back to old stomping grounds. Oh, people's faces, some people's faces have changed. Uh, some of you I don't know, but many of you I do know, and uh, I want to tell you that it's good to see you, and uh, it encourages my heart. And uh, also good to see some little kids ha have become big kids, and uh, you know, kids that weren't even around back when I was here who are now leading Sunday morning service and things like that. That's great to see. I don't know how things are up here with believers, but I want to tell you that in southern Ontario, it seems like Christians are discovering that there is a painful side to living, and that um, that Christianity isn't all a bed of roses that it was made out to be at least back in the 60s and the 70s. And I remember when I became a Christian back in 1958, I, it was not directly taught, but it was certainly implied that, boy, once you accept Jesus as your Savior, things are just going to be sailing. I mean, you're just going to be you know, off in the wild blue yonder and uh, never look back, and it's just going to be great. You'll never regret anything. And, uh, you know, it such a picture of Christianity was painted that the first time you ran across a difficulty, you really uh, had to sit back and say, you know, what's going on here? Am I really a Christian? I thought this kind of stuff wasn't supposed to happen. And um, particularly with some issues that Christians have not dealt with in decades past, I believe that God is um, causing to come to the surface. And of course, when painful issues that haven't been dealt with in the past come to the surface, they are painful. And they are memories that act as if it just happened yesterday, or even today. And so with that in mind, we are ministering a lot in the area of pain and how to deal with it, how to deal with past issues that haven't really been dealt with thoroughly in terms of confession, in terms of the truth, in terms of facing things honestly and not denying things. And one of the um, portions of Scripture that we looked at was found in Exodus chapter... Somebody flipped my pages on me. Exodus chapter 15, beginning with verse 22, and we'll read down to verse 27. And I'm not going to expound the passage this morning. I think probably my gift lies more in the area of exhortation and encouragement. I'll leave the expounding to Stephen and other good teachers that the Lord has given you here. But I want to encourage you this morning. I want to see the Lord encourage you. And um, if that can be accomplished, I will be happy. Beginning with verse 22, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, or he tested them. And he said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now you know that in the progression of God's revelation of himself throughout the book of Exodus, uh, Genesis and Exodus right on through in his dealings with um, the children of Israel, 
he would reveal himself a little bit at a time. And this is one of those key places in Scripture where God gives another name of himself. Now, can someone tell me what the name is here of Jehovah? I am the Lord who healeth thee. I believe this is Jehovah Rapha. There are different names of God that he progressively reveals to his children. And here, God, Jehovah, reveals himself as the healer to his people. And verse 27, very important. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, your word is open before us. It is your word. We ask that you will speak to our hearts through your word and that we will see and discover you as the God who heals us as well as you healed your children in the wilderness. And Father, if there is any here this morning who in very practical ways feels like they are walking in the wilderness and living a life that can be characterized by dryness and blistering heat and trial and tribulation. I pray especially that you administer to that heart and that individual's life. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. How many times have we ever read about the behavior of the children of Israel in the Old Testament and then we have wondered perhaps out loud with statements like, how could they? After all that God has shown them about himself, after all the miracles that God did for them in the wilderness, and then they turn around and they behave like that. They act like that. And then we kind of pat ourselves on the back and we assure ourselves that if we'd have been there, things would have been different. I mean, can you imagine walking on dry land through the Red Sea and God doing this for you and delivering you from the soldiers of Egypt and from Pharaoh, delivering you from a certain death, and then just days later, murmuring, complaining, being part of a lynch mob wanting to kill Moses, we say if we'd have been there, it would have been different. <coughs> Would you have reacted differently? Let's think about Israel. Israel is still in Egypt. They are in slavery and they are experiencing horrible bondage. They have just been told that they have to find their own straw to continue making the bricks. The quota of bricks have been increased and they are more and more, they are being afflicted more and more. They are crying out for their God to deliver them, to remember them, this God who seemed to be alive and active and powerful on their behalf hundreds of years ago, but that's only in their history books now, and in the minds of the elders who pass on the story from generation to generation, and it seems more like legend than reality. But finally, God does come through and remembers them. And he delivers them through a man named Moses and through the series of the ten plagues. And during the course of these ten plagues, the expectations of the people are raised and dashed and raised and dashed and raised dashed because Pharaoh says yes then he says no then he says yes and he says no then he says yes and he says no God knew what he was doing but I'm not sure that the people of God understood what he was doing and I know that one of the greatest sources of frustration and pain and disappointment in a believer's life is this whole process of deferred hope. Deferred hope. Hope that is raised and then dashed again. 
and your expectations are raised to a certain level again, maybe even to a fever pitch, and you say, this week or this year, it's going to happen, whatever it is. And I, I think that every one of us has this mental picture in our imagination of, of, you know, either it's a big ship, whatever it is, my ship is going to come in, or this year the Lord is really going to use me significantly, or this year uh, there's going to be revival with the people of God, or whatever those expectations are, and man, it doesn't happen again. And so you plot along patiently, but sometimes almost like a robot, routinely. And the vitality of your spiritual life and Christian experience sort of drains out. And I think that maybe that's what the people of God are going through here. And through it all, God knows what he's doing, but we often don't understand what God is doing. And my first point here from the history of the people of Israel is that God has his agenda. God has his plans and purposes. And if we lose sight of the fact that our sovereign God has an agenda, has a plan, has a purpose, then we're in for a lot of frustration. We're in for a lot of impatience and disappointment and dashed hopes. Walking by faith often means submitting to God's agenda without understanding what He is doing. Can you see that? Can you picture that? Walking by faith often means submitting to the will of God without understanding what God is doing. That doesn't mean that we have to bury our heads in the sand and don't seek understanding. But in the meantime, we have to trust God just as we as little children often had to trust our parents even though we didn't understand what our parents were doing and have you ever experienced that I'm sure that when I first picked up my child or any one of my children when we went into the swimming pool or into the water at the beach they probably thought I was going to drown them. They didn't understand what I was doing. They learned to trust after a while. Why did God have to harden Pharaoh's heart, for instance? Well, the Bible tells us that Pharaoh was raised up for this purpose so that the providence or the omnipotence and the almightiness of God would be known. Why did God have to send ten plagues? Why not just one? Why didn't he just do it in one big shebang and get it over with? Why did he have to cut the dog's tail off one inch at a time? Why all this pain? In one act, he could have persuaded Pharaoh to let the people go if, God's was, if God was sovereign. There are all kinds of unanswered questions, but God has his agenda, and God is sovereign. Why such a long, drawn-out, and bloody time of judgment over the land of Egypt? The only answer that I can give that is biblically correct, I think, although I don't understand it logically, is that through it all, God was glorified. Through it all, God was glorified. Can somebody tell me what God's glory means? What does the word glory mean? Some of you who have taken... Greek or Hebrew. What does God's glory mean? How would you define the word glory? Greatness. greatness? All right. Even if greatness isn't there? Well, no, okay. That, we're talking about God's glory. But what about the word glory itself? Let's, let's boil it down a little further than that. <coughs> Okay. Glory means re a reflection of who I am. The word glory basically means a reflection of light. That's as, as simple and as basic as you can find a definition for the word glory. But glory means a reflection of 
a person or thing. I mean, everything has its own glory. The Bible tells us that. There's a glory to creation. There's a glory to a woman. Uh, the woman's hair is her glory, the Bible tells us. There's a glory to a man. There's a glory to everything that God has created. In other words, my reflection is my glory. Okay? God's glory is his reflection. And his reflection is a picture or an image of who he is. And who God is was made clearer in God's actions towards Pharaoh and towards the children of Israel. And so God was glorified. That means that God was greater understood in terms of who he is. And because of that, he was exalted. Because of that, his greatness was known. And um, listen, when God's glory is my aim, and when God's glory is my goal and purpose in my life, then I can carry a lot of pain. And I can carry a lot of frustration. And I can deal with a lot of things that don't seem right or don't seem logical or don't seem to fit and don't seem to make any sense. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff going down in people's lives that don't make a whole lot of sense. But if we submit ourselves to God's agenda, we submit ourselves to making God's glory my goal and aim and purpose in life, then I can take a lot of that stuff. But the flip side of that question is this. When my glory and my comfort and my self-preservation is my goal and my aim, and my purpose in life, then I will do everything to avoid pain. I will do everything to avoid discomfort. I will take every shortcut that I can find to make my life more comfortable. And I will manipulate things. I will try to control things in order to see to it that my glory and my goals are realized. So I guess one of the basic questions before us in knowing how to handle pain and knowing how to handle disappointment and dashed expectations in my life is first of all understanding who we are living for. Are we living for God and His glory or are we living for my glory and my own goals, purposes or ambitions? That will define then too the limit to which you can take the discomfort, the pain, the awkwardness, or the dashed expectations. Whose expectations are they, anyway? Whose hopes are they, anyway? Well, you know the rest of the story. The children of Israel were freed. They journeyed out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses until they came up against the Red Sea. At the same time, Pharaoh changed his mind again got his armies together and decided to come after them with his chariots. He was not about to lose his cheap source of labor. And uh, so he went to get them. Israel's back was against the sea. They saw the army coming. They probably saw the dust on the horizon of the chariots and the horses kicking up sand. They cried out to Moses, who in turn cried out to God. And again, God delivered them through the Red Sea. And in one act, he drowned the armies of Egypt. Again, God was glorified. When God's glory is my aim, I can take a lot of pain. God told them exactly what was going to happen. God promised them that he would deliver them. He didn't tell them how. But he promised them he would deliver them. And he did. Through it all, how did the children of Israel react? In chapter 14, verse 11 to 12, this is when their backs are against the sea. Verse 10, it says, When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. 
And they said unto Moses, <clears throat> okay, this is prior to going through the Red Sea, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. I want to tell you that as a leader of some of God's people, I identify with Moses at this point. If any of you have ever done any leading of anybody, whether it's a leader in your own family, you understand that no matter what you do, the leader gets it in the neck when things go wrong. I mean, listen to what they're saying here. Uh, the, the sarcasm is just so, so loaded here. Because there were no graves in Egypt, did you take us out here to bury us here? Like, it's your fault, Moses. Who, who, who were the ones who were crying out to God to be delivered? It's the children of Israel. And yet here they are, and they are saying, it's not... Is not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone, that we, that we can die in Egypt, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to talk about armchair quarterbacking. But yet, this is human nature, folks. This is what we are like. And I'm including myself in this. I recognize the tendency of my own flesh to be like this to want to have it one way one day and then I step out in faith and something bites me in the toe and right away I say, oh no, it can't be this way, it can't happen this way. At any rate, they go through the Red Sea and notice please, <coughs> After God drowns their enemies, they throw a big party. These were the partying type, by the way. You can throw parties. You can celebrate God's goodness by throwing a party. There's nothing wrong with that. And they have a wonderful time. You can read about it in chapter 15. They sing, they dance, they dance, and they sing, and have a great time. They rejoice. They recount firsthand. God's mighty hand of deliverance upon them, how powerful God is. And then we have verse 22 in chapter 15. Verse 21, Miriam is still rejoicing, probably the last thing they heard at this party. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. And in verse 22, they are singing no longer and they are no, are no longer dancing, and they are no longer rejoicing. Their lips are parched and split. Their tongues are sticking to the tops of their mouths. They are marching in the wilderness. The sun is beating down upon them mercilessly. Their children are crying and whining because they're thirsty. Their animals are probably weakened from lack of water. And yet there is no record of them complaining just yet. Maybe Moses had been this way before. Remember that he spent 40 years as a, sh as a shepherd in the desert. He knows his way around in this desert. And maybe Moses was able to assure them that there's water just up ahead if they could just hold out. We don't know. <coughs> but let me stop and get personal here. Many of you have experienced God's awesome hand of redemption on your lives. You had one lifestyle before and it was sheer hell for you. And you were in bondage and you knew it. But you knew no other life. And you thought this was as good as it gets. And then Jesus Christ entered into your life and things changed. And you've experienced God's powerful hand. And redemption for you was sweet and you celebrated and you partied in a sense. And you sang and you danced in your heart and there was freedom, and there was joy, and there was song. But you're not singing anymore. You're not dancing anymore. 
and you're not celebrating anymore. When you come to service, you come to worship, you're just mouthing the words and you don't have a sense of Christ's presence here. And your heart is really not engaged. And you don't celebrate Jesus Christ. And your heart is just as dry as your body would be if you're out in the Sinai Desert for three days without water. And we wonder what happened. I think that Christianity as a whole has sold us a bill of goods, first of all, in the sense that we thought that when I become a Christian, everything is going to be wonderful. And I know that if you've been associated with Northland Bible College Chapel for any amount of time, that myth has already been shattered. <laughs> right? I've, I can remember Dr. Clock Sunday after Sunday. Having any, any trials? <laughs> Bless your hearts, you know. That's the way it was, you know. Um, but still, in our heart of hearts, we want things to be nice. We want things to be comfortable. We want things to be a steady incline towards glory. We don't want things to be down and then struggle up again, down and then struggle up again. And we want Christians to get along. And we want things to be trial-free. We want the goosebumps and the chills and the thrills to stay. And by nature, we want the miraculous seasons of our life to never go away. We want them to last. And when we got saved, perhaps we've tasted of heaven itself, and we've caught sight of God just as Moses did, and we have seen his glory in a sense, just as Moses did. But God had another plan. God has another agenda. He loves us too much to spoil us on sugar and sweetness and sentimentality. Although all of that is necessary. We are emotional as well as intellectual as well as, well as volitional creatures. And so our emotions need to be engaged as much as our minds and wills. But God does not just want us to live on the nice side of emotions for the rest of our lives. And so he, like the children of Israel, leads us into the desert to prove us, to test us, to refine us, to build character. And I want you to notice that as you study the history of the children of Israel, you will find that all the miracles and all the wonderful manifestations of the power and the life of God that the children of Israel saw and experienced did not strengthen their faith. We automatically assume that, man, if God could just do something miraculous right here, right now, I would follow him to the ends of the earth. Hogwash. That's not our nature. That is not our nature. We would not respond that way. The children of Israel didn't. And neither would we because we are just like them. It was the hard times. It was the dry times. The times when the children of Israel were brought and forced to their knees in acts of desperation when they learned the most faith and grew the most character. And just, it works just the same in our lives. It is during the times when sometimes nobody else understands what we're going through, when we cannot relate what we're going through to anybody for love nor money, when we are forced to our knees and forced to a point of realizing, God, if you do not come through here, at this point in my life, I am done, finished. 
and there's no one else that can help. My survival depends on you. You must come through. How many of you ever have been through that kind of trial? Where unless God moves, I'm done. Listen, that's where God wants us. That is where God wants us. Those are the areas where God wants to test us to see whether we will really, really depend on Him. Do you really believe that I am the God who saves? In another portion of Scripture, God says, My arm is not too short that it cannot save. My ears are not deaf that it cannot hear. But your sins have separated between me or you and your God. The, your faithlessness has separated between you and your God. There is no vital dependent faith on Him alone. Because perhaps we have built all kinds of other support systems into our lives and we really have never expressed that our very survival depends on God. Remember, it was the hard times and the dry times, the times spent on their knees in acts of desperation that brought the children of Israel the most faith and character. Now, with reference to our text again, notice that there were three days of desert sand marching. They weren't complaining just yet. They were experiencing thirst and parched and blistered lips and then someone, perhaps a scout, said, there's water up ahead. And if you can just imagine, the text doesn't do this for us, but let's fill in the picture in our imagination. What do you think happens when the word starts buzzing through the camp? There's water just a couple of hours down the road. You can see the pace beginning to quicken a little bit, can't you? And the smell of water probably gets in the nostrils of the animals, and they start galloping a little bit, and the shepherds have to keep up. And, and the kids start picking up their pace in the old men and everything just kind of picks up. And <laughs> hope is starting to be raised again. Can you see it? Can you see it? And maybe by the time they see the water, and it's not, an, it's not a mirage, people are perhaps running pell-mell towards the water, getting their canteens ready or whatever else and they make a dash for the water. And I don't know how they controlled it. Maybe Moses had to organize some kind of crowd control, but then it almost seems too cruel. Just when they are down and out, just at the point of their worst need ever that they've experienced so far, three days without water, they get another kick in the teeth. The water is poison, toxic bitter and they can't drink it God what are you doing what is God up to now have you ever experienced that just when you thought you couldn't take any more bang here's another one right I know you've been there you're human too you're not totally glorified yet What now? What now? The people have a desperate need. It's a perceived need. But remember that God's agenda comes first. God has something to teach them. Now, we we're talking about doctrine this morning in the Sunday school class. God has some doctrine to impart to his children. Teaching can be done at any time. I mean, he could have taught them by the shores of the Red Sea as they watched the uh, soldiers' bodies come lapping up on the shore. Taught them about his wonderfulness and about his awesomeness and that God could do anything. But he didn't choose to at that time. God has something to teach his people here. And uh, I learned here at Northland Bible College that the teaching 
is really not effective teaching unless people learn. All right? The most effective teaching takes place when people are fully listening, when people's attention is fully there, and God's agenda is to get His people to fully listen. And I'll tell you something, you will not find as attentive a group of people as those who have just been forced to recognize that their very survival depends upon listening to God's instructions. Their very survival depends on listening to what God has to say. And what does God say? Very briefly, Verse 26, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals thee. Just as he healed the waters by throwing a branch into the water, he is demonstrating, people, you need me. You need me to bring about healing in your life. You need me to keep you spiritually vital, spiritually healthy, spiritually mature. You need. I want to ask you some personal questions again. Have you been walking in dry places? Have you been experiencing desert sand in the hot sun? Have you experienced the final count and when you already thought you were out, something else came along? Chances are, first of all, that you are blaming your spiritual leaders <coughs> and how good we are at blaming everyone from our spiritual leaders to the devil himself for the shortfall in my own spiritual life, my vit vitality. If it's not God's fault, it's the pastor's fault or the elder's fault or the devil's fault. Or chances are you are looking back to the good old days, just like the Israelites. I mean, can you believe it? The Israelites were thinking back to the days of Egypt. Oh, for the leeks and the garlics of Egypt. Oh, for, I didn't hear anyone say, oh, for the bricks and the kilns of Egypt. Oh, for more work on Pharaoh's pyramids. No. You have a tendency to just remember the positive things, but, you know, really... The good old days were not really all that good, but we think, we deceive ourselves into thinking they were. The reality is that if you are experiencing dryness, if you are experiencing routine and no vitality in your spiritual life, the reality is, although you are deceived into thinking that you are so far from God, the reality is that you have never been more ready to be taught by God some of the most important lessons of your life. And you are being powerfully tempted to short-circuit the process. And there's one thing that I've learned about God. There are no shortcuts. Steve said it this morning. No shortcuts. God will not compromise the way things work. He will not compromise the truth. He will not compromise reality in order to accommodate your pain and your discomfort. What did God teach his children by this event? I believe he taught them, him, them several things. First of all, that life is a cycle of the bitter and the sweet. There is an ebb and flow to spiritual reality. 
You know, there's something about John chapter 3 that I haven't quite put my finger on yet about the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus Christ said that the wind blows where it wants to and you can't tell where it's coming or where it's going, all you can do is hear the sound thereof. He's saying the wind has a sovereign will all of its own and the Spirit of God is like that and the Spirit of God comes and goes. And you see the evidence of it. Um, there is an ebb and flow. There is a mystery to how the Spirit of God works sometimes. And there's a mystical aspect to the spiritual life of the believer that is real. And there is the ebb and flow of the spiritual life, the bitter and the sweet. Secondly, it is only God who can turn the bitter into sweet. Left to ourselves, that water will get more bitter. That circumstance that is causing bitterness in your life will get worse. And in New Testament terms, that circumstance, apart from God, will become a root of bitterness that will eventually destroy you and me. Maybe there is something in your life <clears throat> that is causing bitterness within. that you haven't dealt with. Someone has offended you. You haven't dealt with it. And it becomes a source of bitterness and it poisons the waters. And you need to deal with it. And you can't do it without God and without His instructions on how to deal with it in terms of your relationships. Isaiah 61.3 says that Jesus, prophetically speaking, has come to give to us beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Thirdly, the Lord says, I am the God who heals thee. Churches in general assemblies, whatever you want to call them, are places where a lot of pain and a lot of heartache and a lot of dryness is experienced from time to time. The temptation is to treat those things superficially. How often have you felt a certain way and you simply say to yourself, well, because I'm a Christian, I shouldn't feel that way, and so you stomp it shut or you put the lid on it and you don't deal with why you're feeling that way you just say to yourself well I shouldn't and therefore you deny what's happening in your life I don't think that's what God expects of us at all he wants us to face honestly why we feel a certain way feelings are the result of beliefs we feel a certain way because we believe something and if we are feeling wrongly about something, it means we are believing wrongly about something. And if we don't deal with what we believe before we put the lid on it, it's going to come back. It's going to haunt you. That's what's happening all over the place with the whole issue of sexual abuse in the home. Adults, perhaps 20, 30, 40 years after the fact, are still trying to keep a lid on it and saying, I shouldn't feel this way. And therefore not wanting to look at the issue and dealing with the issue. And it comes out because there are beliefs that we developed as the result of the abuse that are wrong beliefs. And God will not let us get away with that. He wants us to believe the truth, and the Word says the truth shall set you free. And God says, I am the God who heals you. You cannot, you cannot find healing apart from God and doing it His way. 
So the temptation is to treat these heartaches and these pains superficially because we're not comfortable with self-disclosure. We're not